Western observers have long believed that democracy and capitalism go hand in hand, and that economic success both requires and propels political freedoms. Yet China has defied this conventional wisdom, it appears. From the 1980s under Deng's leadership, the Communist Party embraced capitalism without democratization, and it worked, delivering, as the World Bank described, the fastest sustained expansion by a major economy in history. In 2011, China surpassed Japan as the world's second largest economy. Especially after Xi took over in 2012, the West became increasingly worried. Not only was China becoming more authoritarian under Xi, it was also becoming more ambitious, launching global infrastructural projects such as the Belt and Road Initiative. China's economic success under authoritarian rule seemed to convince other countries that autocracies are just as good, if not better, than democracies at promoting growth. It was in this context that the term China model gained currency and became deeply politicized. The assumption was that China's development posed a soft power challenge to the Western liberal model. But is China's economic rise thanks to authoritarianism? Has it proven that autocracy is superior to democracy? No, conventional wisdom has misunderstood the real political foundation of Chinese development. If autocracy were better than democracy at delivering growth, then China would long ago have prospered under Mao. But clearly it didn't. Instead, it suffered poverty, famine, and mass violence. China prospered under Deng not because of authoritarianism, but because he tempered the worst tendencies and dangers of personalist dictatorships. At the highest level of power, Deng introduced four important political reforms. First, he replaced Mao's one-man rule with a norm of collective leadership. Leading by example, Deng led alongside conservatives, and he gave them a voice, even though he was the most influential leader. After him, the Paramao leader was the first among equals in the Politburo Standing Committee of seven to nine leaders who ruled as a team. Second, Deng rejected Mao's personality cult and replaced it with a national culture of pragmatism encapsulated in his famous phrase, seeking truth from facts. It is Mao and not Deng who remains on the Chinese 100 yuan bill. In China, you rarely see statues of Deng, even though he is the man who led the country to prosperity. Third, Deng introduced term limits and institutionalized succession. The norm was each top leader served two consecutive terms, a total of 10 years, and then handed power to a successor. Deng handed power to Jiang, Jiang to Hu, and Hu to Xi. Fourth, he enforced mandatory retirement, insisting that officials past a certain age must step down and give way to young people. Lower down, the reformist leadership changed the incentives of local leaders by updating the cadre evaluation system, which assesses local leaders according to performance targets or KPIs, key performance indicators. Since Chinese officials are appointed rather than popularly elected, these report cards serve an accountability function equivalent to elections in democracies. Changing the targets for evaluating cadres redefined the bureaucracy's goals, making clear to millions of officials what they were expected to deliver, as well as the accompanying rewards and penalties. Reformers reinforced this stark redefinition of bureaucratic success with high-powered incentives. High scores improved the prospects of promotion. Local leaders were also entitled to 
performance-based bonuses, with the highest performers receiving many times more compensation than the lower performers. More than 300 cities and 2,000 counties were ranked publicly against one another every year. Officials from high-ranking locales earned prestige and honorary titles, whereas officials from those at the bottom lost face in their community. Facing strong incentives and fierce competition, local leaders dove headlong into promoting industrialization and growth. They mobilized the entire bureaucracy to attract investors by offering a full range of services, helping investors find suppliers, deal with paperwork, secure parking, and even enrolling their children in desirable schools. Going further, officials also helped developers obtain land by relocating and compensating farmers, building public infrastructure, and carrying out elaborate urban plans to increase the value of development projects. One official in my book quipped, our nation loves capitalists. I feel that no other nation can match our devotion to serving capitalists. Altogether, then carried out a hidden political revolution. Instead of introducing multi-party elections, allowing free expression, or freeing up the media, he reformed China's vast bureaucracy to realize many of the benefits of democratization, in particular, partial limits on power, accountability, and competition, without giving up the stability of one-party rule. Over time, the leadership also opened up pockets of freedom in society, including investigative journalism, nonprofit organizations, mechanisms for citizens to petition or even sue government agencies for wrongful decisions. So long as these citizens did not challenge the regime's right to rule, these pockets of freedom helped the party govern better, stay resilient, because they provide policy feedback and help Beijing uncover problems on the ground. Although these changes appear mundane and don't conform to Western expectations of democratization, they created a unique hybrid, an autocracy with democratic characteristics. It was those democratic characteristics, rather than autocracy itself, that underpin China's hypergrowth and adaptive governance. Enter Xi in 2012. Xi inherited the success enabled by Deng's partial political liberalization. And just as Chinese society had reached a more complex stage of development that demanded more political freedoms and public participation, he clamped down on it. Xi progressively abandoned Deng's partial checks on power, centralizing personal power, sidelining the premier, and encouraging a personality cult, becoming, as some call, the chairman of everything. At the 20th Party Congress in October 2022, Xi broke with tradition and took a third term in office. Furthermore, he stacked the entire cabinet with his loyalists, completing his consolidation of power. Some argue that it is necessary to unify under one strong man in order to overcome Gilded Age problems such as corruption and inequality. This was provided if Xi welcomed honest criticisms and continued with pragmatic policy making. In practice, however, his unchecked power has diminished business confidence as seen during the crackdown on private companies in 2021 and his zero COVID policy, both of which have contributed to an economic slowdown. That is why I emphasize from the beginning that we must distinguish among the three Chinas. The political pendulum has swung from a personalist dictatorship under Mao to a partially liberated Rubei's dictatorship under Deng and back to personalist rule again under Xi. Once we appreciate the political shifts that have occurred from leader to leader, despite having the same political party, it is simplistic to conclude 
that authoritarianism alone accounted for China's rise. For those seeking to learn the right lessons on the political foundation of economic development, one must look specifically to Deng's leadership. And the political system he bequeathed to his successors up until 2012. But even the best of solutions is not perfect. Deng's pro-growth political economy did not remove what Francis Fukuyama calls the emperor problem. A strong man like Xi could come along and dismantle everything. The partial political liberalization that Deng introduced was fragile and reversible. Deng's growth model also contained the seeds of its own destruction. The downsides of growth at all costs included rising inequality, endemic corruption, financial bubbles, environmental degradation. Problems Xi had to deal with, and he chose to deal with them with more political control. Across the Pacific, China's authoritarian revival under Xi coincided with an equally disruptive political turn in the United States. The election of Donald Trump as the 45th president, exposing deep cracks in American democracy. This has created a new confusing phenomenon, great power competition between a personalist dictatorship and an illiberal democracy. Whereas the old Cold War between the US and Soviet Union was a clear-cut contest between a free market democracy and a communist dictatorship, the Sino-American rivalry today is confounded by the fact that both China and America defy simple binaries. The two economies are interdependent rather than in zero-sum competition. The two nations are both living through a gilded age of capitalist accesses, and they are both facing the threat of political regressions. None of this can be reduced to a simple democracy versus autocracy contest. 